Well, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Psalms chapter 32. Let's jump right into it. I have one passage of Scripture for you today. Uh, since I haven't been here in a couple of weeks, I've got to get back in the group. So we have one passage today, all right? So Psalms chapter 32, I'm going to start a new series of messages today called Songs of Deliverance. Songs of Deliverance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways we could talk about deliverance. Uh, we could talk about, you know, the being delivered from your circumstances. And probably some of you, it's funny that Lisa, Lisa didn't know even the subject I was going to go into today. Uh, but uh, she talked about, you know, some of you are in the wilderness. And so sometimes we have circumstances that, are, that we face and God wants to help deliver us. And I, I want to say this very clearly. Most of the time when we're looking for deliverance, we want deliverance from something. I want to say something to you very clearly about Jesus. Jesus isn't interested in delivering you from something. He's, he's interested in de delivering you through something. That's very important. Uh, he doesn't deliver us from our sins. He delivers us through our sins. Uh, and, then, and then let me say something else. You know, that there's another way that we could talk about. There's, we have enemies. Uh, we could talk about flesh enemies, but there's also an enemy that's in this world. The Bible says our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and, and the demonic forces and spiritual realms. And, and so there's a deliverance that God wants to deliver us through when we have those kind of circumstances in our life. But here's the, here's the one I really want to talk about today, that God wants to deliver us from our sins. Uh, it, we live in a society in a world today where we don't want to talk about sin. We don't like to talk about sin. Uh, in fact, we try, and, we try and pretend like sin doesn't even exist. We have an entire generation of people today that say, don't tell me what to do or what not to do. So I want to talk to you about sin, that God really does. There is sin. There is wrong. And, and, and so, uh, and I want, I want you to know that God can deliver you from your sins and deliver you through your sins and deliver you through the blood of Christ. I want to see that today, all right? So let me tell you a little story real quick. Psalm 32 is really a psalm by David. You know King David. Uh, and, and probably the more famous psalm that David wrote, more than Psalm 32, most, many people are aware of this one, is Psalm 51. Uh, Psalm 51 is the story where David goes in and he confesses his sin. I have failed. I have messed up. I ask for your forgiveness. And most people are very familiar with Psalm 51 where it begins to talk about the, the, the confession of the sin. And, and you may remember the sin. Uh, uh, we can find the sin in 2 Samuel chapter 11 where the Bible says that it came uh, at the time of the year where kings go out that David stayed in. Verse 2 says, and he went on his rooftop, and there was a woman on another rooftop named Bathsheba who was bathing, and she was exceedingly beautiful. And he goes on to tell the story that David ended up having an affair with, an, with a married woman. And so, uh, and let me just kind of tell you what happened. So, uh, so David calls in uh, Uriah, who is the husband of this wife, and he, he was gone to war, but he calls him in special and there's a reason that he called him in. The reason he called him in was because uh, he wanted to hide the sin. Okay, now I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Right, so I want you to get that picture. So he wanted to hide this sin. He didn't want anyone to find out about it. So we're going to talk about that. But when we get to Psalm 32, Psalm 32, it looks like he's talking about the same sin, which he is. But he's really, if you look at verse 8 of chapter 32, he tells us he's an instructor. In other words, uh, many, many scholars believe that Psalm 32 was actually written after Psalm 51. And I know there's a lot of people who wonder, why, okay, why, why is it out of order? Okay, very much in the same way that uh, if you were to have a hymn book. How many of you glad we don't have hymn books that we use in this church? <clears throat> Two or three of you. It's too bad for the rest of you. So anyway, because <laughs> we're not doing that. Anyway, I'll tell you why here in a moment. But so you know, in the Psalms, it's like a hymn book. And so when you put together a hymn book, you don't put together the hymns in chronological order of when they were written. It's just a compilation of all the songs. Does that make sense? And so Psalm 51 was probably written before Psalm 32. And so he, it's 51 is his confession. Psalm 32 is his instruction to say, be careful about falling into sin. Does that make sense? And so let me just read it for you, and I think it'll help us understand it. We are not going to put the words on the screen, all right? Uh, so let me say it real clearly. Uh, turn in your Bible to Psalm 32, all right? Look with, with me to verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I want you, if you had a, 
a pen or a marker or a highlighter or a way to mark that little passage, uh, underline those little words, whose sin is covered. Do you remember that? It's very important. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. Now let me just pause on this little word, Selah, for just a moment, all right? Uh, when you look into a hymn book today, we find not only words, but we also find the tune to the song. If you were to look at that tune, you would notice that there are notes, what we call notes, that are on the staff or on the bar. And so uh, they would be quarter notes or whole notes. Well, sela would be like what we call arrest. How many of you know the musical term arrest? Do you want to know what that is? Okay, so arrest just means pause. It means, to stop, it means a break in the music for a moment. So that's what sela really is. It's interesting to me that whenever we look into the hymn book of the Bible, and let me say real quickly, Psalms is the hymn book of the Bible. However, there are songs recorded for us all the way from the book of Genesis through Exodus, all the way through the entire Old Testament. And we find songs in nearly every single book of the Bible all the way through the book of Revelation. Let me tell you what's interesting about it. In all of the songs that are recorded for us in the Bible, not one song, not one song do we have the tune for. It's very important you get that. We don't see quarter notes. We don't see whole notes. We don't see uh, eighth notes. We don't see, we don't see anything. We don't, we don't know what the measure was. We don't know what the tune is. Let me tell you why, we, why, the, why the Bible doesn't record for us a tune. It's very important to catch this. The Bible doesn't record for us a tune because the anointing is not on the tune. The anointing's on the words. Amen. You catch that? And, and, and we have entire, uh, an entire group of people today that they get so wrapped up in the tune and they think, well, you can't worship God that way because that's not the way Paul and Silas did. As if we know what Paul and Silas did. <laughs> right? I mean, we're told that they sang a song while they were in prison. We have some of the words of that song that they sang while they were in prison, but we don't know what the tune was. Because here's the thing. Don't get so wrapped up in the tune. Tunes are going to change, but it's the words that will last and endure forever. Does that make sense? That's, that's why words are so important to what we sing. But here's the interesting thing. Not one time do we have a quarter note or a whole note in Scripture, but it's interesting. The only thing that we have of the tune is the rest, the selah. And let me tell you why that's important to this message. Because when we look at the word Selah, here's what it really means. It means stop. It means take a moment. And, and I like this definition better than any other. What he's really saying is, what I just said, what do you think about that? Take a moment to think through what it is I just said. Let, let, me, let me just kind of reiterate what he said. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with fever heat of summer. What do you think about that? I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. What do you think about that? Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. What do you think about that? I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include a bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy all you who are upright in heart. Well, David does something very interesting here. He begins to tell what happens when you fall into sin. 
And uh, I want to give you uh, four points today. Uh, yay, five. You know, the Bible talks about there are six sins that are an abomination to God. Yay, seven. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, four points. Yay, five. All right. And so uh, there's a point that I kind of left out on purpose, and you'll see why as we go through this. But I want you to catch this. All right. So I want to start with talking about sin. All right. So let's talk about sin for a minute. Uh, David tells us a little bit about sin. He said there's basically two things that happen with sin that everyone does. Every sin that a person commits. Let me just say so we all understand this, okay? We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not even one. This is, these are words right out of the Bible. We've all sinned. Okay, can we all agree with that today? Okay. Let me tell you what we do with sin. And we learn this at a very early age, all right? The first thing that we always want to do with sin is we want to hide it. We want to conceal it. And we learn this at a very early age. I can prove this to you. You may remember, and by the way, you don't have to teach your children to do this. They automatically do it. Uh, you know, some of you may remember when you had children that were real young uh, and, and you told them, stay out of the cookie jar. Stay out of the cookies. Your little child would find a way. They would pull a chair over. They'd climb up on the counter. They would get into the cookie jar. They had a cookie in their hand. They had it all over their mouth. Chocolate smeared back off the back side of them. I mean, both hands, cookies in both hands. You walk in, you catch them in the act. And you say, did you get into the cookies? And what do they do? Nope. Right? Because this is the way sin works. One of the first things we want to do is when we get caught in sin, we want to hide it. We want to conceal it. We, want to, we don't want anyone to know about it. We conceal it. This is exactly what David did. The Bible says in Psalm 32, verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groanings all day long. I, I, I love how the New Living Translation talks about concealing sin. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 3, uh, uh, let me read this out of the Message Bible. The Message Bible says this, when I kept it all inside... When I kept it all inside, I thought I had gotten away with it. He says, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. The pressure never let up. All the juices of my life dried up. Can, I, can, can, we, can we be real honest with each other today? How many of you, be honest, how many of you have ever tried, ever tried to conceal sin? Can we just be honest with each other? All of us, right? You remember the pressure of it. Maybe you're in it right now. Maybe you're in a sin situation. You're trying to conceal it. You're trying to hide it. You think no one will ever find out. You know, David caught himself in the very same spot. He, and he says, I, when I was caught in the midst of this, it was like all the life was sapped out of me. And, and you know what you have to do? You have to, in order to conceal a lie, you have to create a new lie and create a new narrative. And in order to cover that up, you've got to create a new narrative. Well, in David's life, this exact thing happened. He goes and has an affair with a married woman, and he thinks to himself, I need to hide this thing. So he calls Uriah in from the battlefield, and he says, how's it going out there in the battlefield? And Uriah tell, gives him a full report, and he goes, but this was never his intent to find out how it was going to the battlefield. His, he, he, Bathsheba had sent word to David, hey, I'm pregnant. David thought to himself, man, I'm going to be caught. I'm going to be in trouble if I can just get him home. And he can go in and be with his wife. He'll think it's his child. So he tells him, he says, listen, I'm going to send you back to the battlefield. But before you go, I want you to go and have a good time with your wife tonight. He didn't care about Uriah. He was all about concealing his sin. He had some men follow him that night. They came back to David the next day and they said, you know, Uriah didn't go home to his wife last night. David was angry. Why didn't he go home to his wife? So we don't know. He went to the gate, and he stood at the gate all night long. So David called Uriah back in. He says, did I not tell you to go and be, the, be with your wife tonight before you have to go back to the battlefield? And here's what Uriah said. He goes, how could I go enjoy the pleasure of my wife knowing that all of my men are standing on that battlefield dying tonight? So in order to cover that up, David sent Uriah back to the battlefield, but he gave word, put him on the front lines so that he can be killed. Obviously, he didn't tell them he was putting him on the front line to be killed, but that was in his heart. I know if I put him on the front lines, he'll, he'll die. And then they'll think that he spent the night with his wife and no one will ever know. It'll be completely concealed. No one will ever find out. 
One of the things I know about Scripture, the Bible says in Numbers 23, verse 32, be sure your sins will find you out. He thought no one had known. In fact, almost a year passed by. No one knew. One day, God, who was angry at David for what he had done, went and told Nathan, the prophet, this is what David has done. And he told Nathan, he said, I want you to go to King David and I want you to confront him about his sin. Nathan was fearful. If he's already had one man killed, surely he'll have me killed. So Nathan came up with a story. He went into King David and he told him this story. He said, David, he said, I need to tell you something. He goes, there's a rich man and there's this poor man. And the rich man took advantage of the poor man and took away the only thing that he really had. David was angry that this rich man had treated a poor man in such a way. He jumped up and was angry. He said, bring that man to me. I'll bring justice to his life. Nathan said, David, it's you. You're the rich man that took advantage of a poor man. And in that moment, David broke. Realizing that he had sinned knowing he had sinned, and knowing he had just been outed. Concealed sin. Let me, let, me, let me read the rest of what happens here in this story. This is out of the message Bible. He says, my life dried up. Verse 5 says, then I let out, I let it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. And suddenly, the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. Let me, let me t- give you the great news, that if we will bring our sins into the light, God says, I'm going to dissolve them. Your guilt is going to disappear with what you've done. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad for the grace of God? So, concealed sin. There's a second thing that we do with sin. Not only do we conceal it, the second thing we do is we like to, to be conceited uh, about it. So, there is concealed sin and there is conceited sin. There is hidden sin and there is another way to say this, there's haughty sin. We live in a society of people today that we're haughty about sin. Yeah, that's right, I've sinned, and what is it to you? I don't really care if it's sin. I'm going to do anything that I want. It's my sin. I'm not going to change. Well, David actually addresses that. Look down at verse 8. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you. I'll teach you in the way which you should go. I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. Watch this, verse 9. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which has no understanding whose trappings include a bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Well, I want you to just catch this real quick. How, how many of you have ever ridden a horse before? Anyone ever ridden a horse before? I remember years ago when I was a kid, uh, our youth group went out to a place in Maryland uh, to ride horses, and we actually went out to ride horseback at nighttime. I'd never done that before, and I was so excited. And we got out there, and of course, I was like most boys, you know, you're— you know, you think you're tough, you know, you think you're a cowboy. And, and uh, we were living in Washington, D.C. among Redskins. So, you know, uh, and I was, a, I, was a, I was a Dallas Cowboy fan, so everyone thought I was a cowboy. Man, I had me a cowboy hat and, uh, that I had bought, and I had me cowboy boots. And uh, I'd real, uh, here's the reality. I'd never really hardly even ridden a horse. But anyway, so uh, we go out there, and the, and the, and the, the owner of the stable said, I, this, is good. this horse is pretty highly spirited. It's going to take someone pretty strong to ride this horse. Anyone want to be the one for this? Well, everyone else is backing down. This horse was tall. I mean, a bit, you know, some horses are short to me, you know. So, but anyway, this horse was a tall horse. And I remember thinking, yeah, I'll take care of that one. Let me get on that one, you know. So I got up on that big black horse. And, uh, you know, it's kind of jostling around and everything. And you could tell it's pretty high-spirited. And so we went for a horseback ride through the woods. But that horse was just strong-willed. And I don't know if you've ever been on a horse that has a strong will. And uh, so, you know, we'd try and go someplace, and that horse, you'd, you'd want to turn that horse, and you'd turn it like that, and it still wanted to go its own direction, you know. And finally, I kind of got it to going down some of those paths. But when we started making the turn, and we were coming back, that we, as soon as that horse caught sight of the barn, off it went. I mean, full gallop. Whoa, going to the barn, and I'm turning the horse like this. The horse's head is just like this. Can't even see the barn anymore. It's still running right at the barn, you know. I'm thinking, my goodness, what have I gotten myself onto? Here's what David said. He goes, there are people who get caught in sin and they're so strong-willed, it doesn't matter. You can put a bit and bridle in their mouth, but they will not turn. 
And he, and, he, and he closes that statement out by saying this. He says, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. They keep going at it, and they think that it does not matter and that no one will catch them, and, it do, and, and you know, just haughty about it. I, let me say something to you. Many of you who are in this room, probably there's probably some people who are in this room today, you are trapped in sin, even as I'm speaking this morning. You are in, in the middle of it right now, and I'm going to prove to you that you're haughty about it, okay? I'm going to prove it to you. Because we'll come into an invitation time, and you'll get an opportunity to get free and to be set free. And here's what you'll think to yourself. I'm not going up there. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to get free from this. I'll just stay in it. I don't want anyone to ever know that I'm a sinner. You know, you know what's crazy about that? We're all sinners. Every one of us. That's one of the things I love about this church, because I'm telling you, you can come at prayer time and say, man, I'm, I'm trapped. I'm caught in sin. And we'll still love on you. You know why? Because we've all been caught. We've all been trapped. We can still love you. We can help you. And let, me, let me say, there's a statement that we've been making a lot lately. But I'm telling you, we love you so much that you can come just like you are. But we love you too much to leave you like you are. We want you to change. We want God to get a hold of your life. Isn't that great? So conceited sin. I love how that ends, though. David goes on to say this. Uh, he says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, uh, he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Uh, I, I love how the New Living Translation says that. New Living Translation says, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. You know what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Because of our conceited sin, many of us deserve a, a swift judgment. But thanks be to God who gives mercy. Amen? Amen? So, a conceited sin. Here, let me give you the third point today. So, we're going to shift from sin. I want to talk about our Savior for just a moment, all right? So, here's the third point. We have a covering Savior. We have a covering Savior. Isn't it interesting? He talks about both of those. He talks about a hidden sin and a concealed sin. He talks about a conceited sin. But in both of those, he does something amazing. He says, but there's hope. There's hope. And there's a little verse that, if you'll notice, I actually skipped over it. It's right in the middle of those two things. It's in verse 7. Verse 7 says this, You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Well, I looked up that little word, hiding place, uh, in the Hebrew. Actually, in the Hebrew, hiding place is one word. But I want you to catch this. Very interesting. You know what the word hiding place is? A literal translation of that word from the Hebrew, what it literally means? It means you are my covering. You're the one who covers me. Got to thinking about God covering. Came to me real quick. Book of Genesis. Adam and Eve are in the garden. He says, of any tree in the garden you can eat, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve sees that tree and there's a serpent that begins to deceive her and she falls into the trap of sin think about it did she try and hide it did Adam try and hide it yes they did because the Bible says later on God came down in the cool of the day to find them and they were hiding remember that they tried to let me tell you what's funny they began to even try and cover their own sins the Bible says they went and make made clothing out of fig leaves now I, I have a fig tree in my backyard. Anyone have a fig tree or know what a fig tree is or ever been around a fig tree? My grandmother had a huge fig tree in her backyard and uh, I'm hoping one day my fig tree will be that big. Now, let me tell you something I know about fig leaves, all right? They have little teeny tiny uh, hair fibers all over them. Now, I'm just going to make a statement. You know how poor we are at covering our own sin? Think about this. They chose the most fibrous tree that there is to put on their private parts. I, th I think it's really interesting to me because uh, I'm thinking that might have irritated just a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this is what we'll do. We try and cover. We try and hide. And our very best attempt at covering our own sins is poor at best. Is poor at best. God comes and says, what have you done? They, after blaming, because that's what we like to do, that's conceited. After blaming, well, she did it. 
Eve, what did you do? Well, the serpent made me do it. We, that's, that's just conceited. It's just pride and arrogance rather than just saying, well, I, I messed up. Sorry. Tried to blame. It's conceited. God says he looked at them and he felt sorry for them. And the Bible says that he provided for them animal skins to wear. Something we don't ever really think about. Where did God get the animal skins? I want you to think about this. God provided the very first sacrifice. He says, what you provided, it's not good enough. It will not cover what you've done. Let me make a sacrifice for you. And he provided animal skins. Well, as soon as I thought about that, the second I thought about that covering, do you realize 2,000 years ago, God provided a lamb, the lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. I want you to see this. Jesus hung on a cross. He was the lamb of God. And the reason he hung on that cross was to provide a covering for all of our sins. Isn't that great news? Aren't you glad that we have a covering Savior? Well, I, I left out a little thing here. If I were going to add in another point, it would be right here at point three. I would add in this little point, there are consequences to sin. There are consequences to sin. Now, I'm not talking a lot about the consequences of sin because we have a covering Savior, but I want you to think about something. Even David had consequences of sin. The Bible says that that child that Bathsheba uh, bore for him, uh, when that child was born, was sick. And we're not told exactly how long that child lived, but it wasn't very long. David mourned his sin so greatly, and he begged God that this child would not have to die because of his own sin. And he was so remorseful about the whole circumstance of the situation, but there was still a consequence for that sin. In fact, the Bible tells us that the elders who were around David were afraid to come to David and tell him, your son has died. David overheard them talking about it in the hall, and he says, tell me, has my son died? And they said, yes, he's died. And great was the sorrow of David that day. Not only was he sorrowful that that child died, but he was also sorrowful for what he had done. But I'm going to tell you something about the covering of God. There is grace to be extended even in the midst of sin. Because here's what's interesting. Most people don't even catch this. The Bible goes on to say that after all of David's repentance, later on, uh, David and Bathsheba had another child, and his name was Solomon. Now tell me that's not the grace of God. I I'm saying to you that God can turn the circumstances of your life into joy down the road because of having a covering Savior. And that's exactly what David's talking about. He says, you have become my hiding place. You have become my covering. You have become my song of deliverance, even though I didn't deserve it. You're my covering Savior. Let me give you this last thing. We have a celebrated Savior. We have a celebrated Savior. There's something I noticed that's kind of interesting. Even though he's talking about sin in the middle, and he's talking about a covering Savior in the middle, something happens at the beginning of this song, and something happens at the end of this song that's amazing. Watch what happens at the very beginning. And I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Uh, New American Standard says, How blessed. But New Living Translation says this, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. Can we call that a celebration? What a joy whose sins, whose disobedience are forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who rec uh, whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. I'm saying to you that not, not only does God forgive sin, but God also forgives the guilt of sin. I mean, if you're caught in sin right now, there's probably an immense amount of guilt that's over the top of you. I've got great news for you. There is joy when you come to the Lord who forgives not only the sin, but forgives the guilt of that sin. It's great news. And it should be celebrated. Let me tell you something that's interesting. Probably more, more, probably more famous than Psalm 32 is Psalm 51 where he makes his confession. But here's what's interesting. Nowhere else in Scripture is Psalm 51 quoted. But Psalm 32 is quoted. In fact, it's quoted in the book of Romans where 
the Bible tells us about how sin is forgiven. Let, let me just show it to you. You may be familiar with the passage. Romans chapter 4 is where Paul is saying, hey, you can't earn this. If you think you can work hard enough to get your sins forgiven, you're messed up. You're missing it. And right in the middle of talking about works versus grace, he quotes David. Watch this. Here's what happens. Romans 4 verse 4. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. Let me say something about salvation. Salvation can't be earned. You can't work for it. It's given to you by faith and, and through God's grace. That's it. Verse 5 says, But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Okay, I, want, I want you to catch this. Uh, David did not have to work for this righteousness. He trusted God for his forgiveness and God forgave him. Is that great news? And then he, and he goes on and gives us the quote, verse 7, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Isn't that great? I'm saying to you, getting, celebrating, celebrating covered sin is not because you were able to do it. Celebrating covered sin is because he did it, and you never could. You never could. In fact, I got to thinking about, you know, he's talking about celebrating He's talking about joy. And I had this thought. Have you, ever, have you ever been in church where there was someone who was just exuberant in their worship? You ever seen that person? I mean, they are, man, they are lifting their hands and they are excited and they're praising God. And they're, man, thank you, Lord. And, and man, when there's a moment, they, whoo, you know, they give a good hoop and praise you, Lord, and hallelujah. And they're shouting. You ever seen someone who's that exuberant about worship? You know why that they are exuberant about worship? Here's what I think, because I know myself. You know why they're exuberant about worship? Because they know how bad they are, and they know how great he is. You know what the difference between them and you is? They know how great he is and how bad they are. You just haven't figured it out yet. Because when you find out how bad your sins is, you'll get exuberant about your worship of God too. We're all bad. He is good. David celebrated that. Here's how he finishes Psalm 32. Verse 11. I want to read this out of the Message Bible. Celebrate God. Sing together, everyone. All you honest hearts, raise the roof. This was not a celebration that was quiet and internal. Here's what we all say. Well, I just celebrate God in my own way in my heart. Don't tell David that. It was David who came dancing in in his underwear. It's true. He said, I will celebrate God because I realize that it's God who gives a victory and not man. Are, are, are you, and I'm, please, don't please, no one come in your underwear. I'm not... That would be a little bit of a distraction to saying, all right? So, but, but I do want us to understand, here's what he says. He goes, if you'd, ever, if you'd ever get honest with yourself, if you'd ever get an honest heart, if you'd realize how bad you are and how good God is, you'd raise the roof too. Here's, here's what the teenagers did last night when I said raise the roof. They went, whoo, whoo. Anyway, so... <clears throat> I mean, why do we not get so excited about what God has done for us? I mean, he has set us free. I mean, let me stand before you and make a declaration. I have concealed my sin. I have, I have had haughty sin. But praise be unto God who's forgiven me from all of it. Who has covered it. And I will celebrate him. How about you? Will you remain in your haughtiness? Will you continue to hide it? Or will you finally come and say, okay, God, I'm ready to do it your way.